to REI Talk. It's our weekly investment webinar brought to you by Real Estate Investor. Today's webinar is sponsored by Opportunity Private Capital. My name is uh, Neil Peterson. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief of Real Estate Investor. And we have been serving the South African residential and commercial real estate industry for over 14 years now through our digital magazine, uh, online content, live and virtual events, webinars, masterclasses, videos, and podcasts. And we keep the investor up to date with the latest inside investor information, education, investment opportunities, and innovations for newbie and savvy property investors. Whether you're a home buyer, a landlord, a developer, property professional, or a practitioner in the industry, we are here for you. And uh, this webinar is part two in our three-part series, and it's brought to you by Opportunity Private Capital. Our topic for today is types of alternative investments available, risk versus reward. In this webinar, we'll look at the current state of the South African economy, as well as unpack the investment markets to unravel which areas, particularly in the real estate sector, that are performing best and those which have performed the worst. And uh, we will discuss and direct you to investment nodes that you could consider investing in um, based on your unique personal objectives. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you in more detail to John Lucy. John is currently commercial property economist and property strategist at First National Bank. Besides being a banker, John's background is also a specialist in the residential household sector. And John reports quarterly on the property market outlook on both property and economic trends, and he is an authority in this space. So Ben Kodazang, he's qualified as a chartered accountant at Ernst & Young. His investment career started at Liberty Asset Management. He then became Chief Investment Officer of African Harvest Fund Managers, founder member of Prodigy Asset Management. Thereafter, he spent a decade at Old Mutual primarily as MD of Old Mutual Properties, and he led its significant growth from 2004 to 2012. And then he moved on to Stanlib as Head of Asset Management Division, and finally moved to Sunlum as Managing Director of Africa. He's also a past president of SAPOA, past chairman of Westro, and South African Corporate Real Estate Fund. Now, Ben is currently the founder and CEO of ALT Capital Partners, a special investment business focusing. So first of all, welcome to you, Ben, and also to you, John. Great having you on the show. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, thanks, Neil. <clears throat> Great, and it's, uh, we look forward to the discussion. I think there's, we're going to unpack some really good things. And of course, last but not least, uh, Nick Morgan. Nick is currently co-founder and director of Opportunity Private Capital in the investment and property arena. He's a specialist in value outcomes in investment development and investment strategy. And through his valuable experience in investment banking with HSBC, global development structuring and property development, Nick is hellbent on providing investors with the best alternate investment returns and for the best options for the highest returns. So welcome to you, Nick. It's great having you again. Okay, right, let's move into our whole discussion of today. And we're gonna start off with John, John Luce. And I think, John, we'd like you to start unpacking the South African economy, where we are right now and also into the future. And I mean, I know today we are sitting in really uncertain and challenging times. I mean, we have both the pandemic and we also have now additional challenges thrown our way with the current protests, there's violence, there's looting going on, um, which I'm sure is going to have a, an additional negative effect on the South African economy. So really the question is, John, you know, what are your views on the, on the outlook of the South African economy and the effect right. of this volatile situation of the pandemic, as well as this looting and, and, and violence uh, going forward? Okay, Neil, well, I think it's important to, you know, I don't pay much attention to single events. I, I try and look at a, at a bigger picture and I talk about the economic super cycle. That's not all the short little fluctuations which come and go once every few years as interest rates go up or down or something happens. It's the longer term, bigger picture. And we've had probably two big economic super cycles in my lifetime. Um, and they have big implications for the environment, uh, not only the economic and the political environment, but the property environment as well. 
Now, the last big economic super cycle downturn, if you could call it that, took place. We had, we had sort of glory growth years in the 1960s. The 1970s, the global economy started to take us down a notch. Then came the boycotts and the sanctions. It was a short gold boom, but I ignored that. That was so short-lived. And we, we, we just stagnated into the 1980s and all the way into a three-year recession in the early 1990s. As that happens, as the lack of economic opportunity mounts because of a lack of economic performance, so the anger and frustration starts to mount. The poverty increases. There, there's, there's, there's a general increase in the unhappiness. And of course, that's not only, it's not only the poor that feel it. At the top, in the affluent, certain affluent or you know, people in privileged positions are slowly starting to get squeezed out of there. You know, there's more competition at the top as well, and there's more fighting. So it's almost like, I guess in a way, you could liken it to a sports team. I don't know if you've seen, you know, you, you watch sport over the years. And you know, when, when a team's going well and they're winning the European Champions League and everything's rosy, there might be personalities in the, in the team that don't even particularly like each other. But when you're all winning, everybody's happy. When you get to the losing and the team's underperforming and the pressure mounts and the spectators are on your back, et cetera, okay, and the sponsors want to pull you, um, that's when the infighting starts. And everybody's on each other's, you know, and you see some spectacular implosions in the teams. And it's, it's, it's a bit like that as well. So you go into this stagnation phase, the anger mounts, you see it in unrest numbers and all the rest. And, and that often is the catalyst for big policy and politi radical policy and political change. The last super cycle stagnation being exactly that. By 1990, the situation was untenable. The pressure on the declared government was so great. And eventually the big announcements were made. And then we had a, a super cycle upswing after that had been sorted out and we had achieved a new political settlement and we had much better economic growth years and interest rates came down, the boycotts and sanctions were gone and it was wonderful. But now we find ourselves back since about 2008, we ratcheted up the debt. So we can't pull the interest rate levers anymore. We can't pull the fiscal levers anymore because government's ratcheted up its debt. All the, the nice things we've, we've done to keep the economic party going are sort of run out. And there's all these structural constraints which have dragged us back into the next super cycle stagnation phase, which I say started in about 2008. And again, you've seen similar pictures to the last, to previous one. If you looked at unrest related incidents, they've been rising. Um, strike action, that's been rising, service delivery protests, a whole lot of things as the frustration and the anger mounts. And that's where we find ourselves now is, is where, you know, people are looking too much maybe at the, the, the specific incident that played itself out this last week. The, that was just a, a sort of a, 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 the, the catalyst or whatever you could, yeah, it was just, it just set, set, set off what was really waiting to be set off. There is a lot of anger. There is a lot of frustration. We need the structural reform. We need policy change to turn this around, get our economy growing faster again, and then happier days come. Um, that's, that, that's ultimately what we need. So we need to accept that for, I think, that for as long as the structural reforms aren't yet achieved, and I, I do believe that the Ramaphosa administration intend, genuinely intends to implement good structural reforms, fix the ESCOMs and do all the things that will get us going better. But it's a long, hard road because it will be met with resistance by many human beings. And that's always a human thing that resist the change. Why do they resist the change? Because many are going to lose. They're not going to be in the privileged positions anymore when the change comes. So that's what, that's where we are now. We're in the super cycle stagnation. I believe it's sending us on the way to the next big political change, next um, whatever that may be. And for the time being, it'll be a pretty volatile ride. I don't think this, this unrest will, you know, it'll come and go. You know, it's not, this is not here on a sustained basis a few days, and I think it'll calm down. But, but, um, but we'll be in and out of volatile situations more frequently, as we have been increasingly since about 2008, if one looks at a lot of the unrest statistics. It's a reality that we're going to have to live through. That's the, that's, the, that's the super cycle, as I'm describing it in very brief detail. Okay, so what I, what I also liked when you had the, uh, uh, our initial discussion, John, uh, and if we just look at, and, and if you switch on the news, 
you, you, it's unavoidable. I mean, you, you see the looting and, and, uh, and uh, the, the violence that's erupted. It's all over the media. Um, you actually gave a great analogy, and I think it's a very refreshing sort of economic look, the way you've sort of positioned it now. And you compared it with, uh, I think it was a thatched a moment for South Africa. Do you want to just maybe just elaborate a bit on that in terms of what you yes, were trying to... So, yeah. so, so there, there, are, there are people, so, so let's go back to the previous political change, the big declare announcements, which he eventually had to make. Uh, you know, there wasn't much room for him to maneuver anymore. And, and, he, and you know, the, the announcement of the end of apartheid rule was effectively the 2nd of February, 1990. It was in 1994. It was four years earlier. And from then on, for four years, just over four years, we sat through a terribly uncertain period. That's what political change brings. There's various groupings jockeying for the privileged position in a new dispensation. There were far right and far left groups who felt they were going to be left out, trying to sabotage the protest with terror attacks and all sorts of ugly things. And we sat through a particularly uncertain period for four years, which eventually turned out well. It turned out very well. But at some stage around about 1992, I mean, when, when Chris Harney got assassinated, for instance, you, you really struggled to believe that it was going to end well. Uh, it really was pretty dark times and really, really uncertain. And eventually it did, but, but that's the period. So the point is that big reform, um, a, a radical policy change, whatever that may be, will be met with radical resistance. I think that's always going to be the case. And, and yes, Margaret Thatcher showed us in Britain. She, she, she needed to do a lot of structural reform. Britain was going the wrong way. Well, many of us economists would believe she needed to close down mines or privatize mines and, and, and you get them away from the tax, you know, taxpayer footing the bill. There were a whole lot of things she needed to do because they, it was unsustainable. And of course, you know, the miners were going to lose out. That was the unfortunate reality. So um, she then announced the privatization of the mines. There was a nationwide strike call and it was disruptive. It was disruptive, but it was crucial for her to stay the course not blink first and follow through and, and, and defeat the opponents. That unfortunately is what has to happen. That's what de Klerk and Mandela between them had to do in, in, in the early 90s as well. They had to stay the course. And at times it was pretty close to going off course. But, you know, there were other parties trying to, around trying to sabotage it. You had to show the political will. You had to show the determination despite all the disruption and the... Uh, you know, the, and, and, and the chaos that it brought. And, and the, this is where we are now. If we want structural reform, um, the President Ramaphosa has to stay the course and push it through. There will be resistance. When, when, when parastatal people get retrenched or whatever it might be, there will naturally be opposition. That's a human thing. And Mrs. Thatcher experienced a huge amount of that. And only with sheer strong will of her and her party were they eventually able to turn Britain around and implement the structural reforms they needed? And that's where we are now. I guess we're now, to a certain extent, in our Margaret Thatcher moment, if you could call it that. Yeah. Excellent. I think just a, a great way just to position where we're at. Ben, I'm going to bring you in now. Um, ben, obviously, I'd just like to talk about, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on this because, I mean, it is sort of hot off the press news. It's, it's real. It's happening out there. But I mean, what are the effects on investors out there? I mean, you, you, you've worked for the big three, certainly uh, owners in property. And before we get to your sort of investments uh, um, and start unpacking that, can you tell what, I mean, what kind of thing does it, what are the effects? I mean, we've seen shopping centers get looted. 200, I think, have been looted. There's a lot that's been closed down with more to close down. Do you want to maybe just, just comment on that? Yeah, thanks, uh, Neil. Yeah, the last few days, I guess, have not been pleasant. Uh, but the way I think about it is maybe what John was also alluding to, to say the factors were already there, probably pre-COVID. And when I say the factors, I mean, South Africa sitting probably, sorry, not probably, South Africa sitting at the highest Gini, in, Gini <laughs> coefficient in the world, the highest level of inequality, high unemployment, and pretty high poverty levels, right? So you could say that uh, the boiling pot was there. Uh, 
COVID added a bit of fuel to the fire in terms of highlighting some of this inequity. And clearly the political uh, environment as well hasn't really assisted, right? In the sense that a lot of the people on the ground have seen through the Zonda Commission how much was looted from state funds uh, through political intervention. And at the same time, there are no jobs that are being created. So I guess you could argue that it's a, it was yeah, a hot potato waiting to happen. But that's said and done. I mean, the last three days, clearly we've seen what the currency has done as a reaction. And from a property perspective, it has not been pleasant the last few days. There's been millions and millions. Um, yeah, it's probably billions, actually, because then from the least count, there's yeah, over 500 million rands worth of damage already. And clearly, supply chains uh, being affected. So it's one of those things where I guess you go back to risk and then you start thinking about, uh, we never think risk management, right? So if you don't have a CESRA policy, so CESRA is helping quite a lot in terms of at least uh, helping the owners with uh, protection on destruction and a bit of loss of income. And I've been quite encouraged seeing uh, the second wave of Concerned citizens who are into looting, uh, the taxi association has come to the party. And um, yeah, so it's encouraging from that point of view to say that there has been intervention, but more importantly, society or the normal men in the street is standing up and saying, enough is enough. Absolutely. And I think very good point. Thank you for bringing that forward. I think, you know, you ask yourself, you know, what is the solution? And I don't want to pose that question now because uh, we, could, we, could, we could change the whole, swing the webinar in terms of the subject. So Ben, I, I want to also ask, I want to move now into the investment space because you've got a lot of experience in specifically in the alternative investment space. And uh, I mean, you've got, you've been just about everywhere. You've got, you really got a sort of almost like a helicopter view of what's going. Now you're working in the African markets. Um, now, can you perhaps highlight where in the continent, and maybe let's allude to Africa, where are they performing well and, and why? Because uh, so I'd just like to open the whole sort of investment discussion now. And maybe you can enlighten us. So how do you see that? Yes. <clears throat> so let's bring it back to basics and then I'll get back to the rest of the continent to say if you follow the money, so global monies in terms of new funds or fund allocations have really been driven off a theme called impact investing, right? So I guess money is saying that um, the biggest dislocation in terms of supply and demand is primarily in, um, can I call it real assets or alternative investments. So I describe those as infrastructure, private equity, there's a whole lot of alternative property that we can get into as well. So all those uh, asset types where to a large extent your investment is protected by uh, predictable, reliable grain income streams. So there's secured income to validate the value of those investments. So if I start with South Africa as an example, so the last 10 years, I suppose, is uh, quite telling. I think the built environment, when you look at retail, we overbuilt in terms of your big shopping centers, so super regional. We are the second largest GLA per capita outside of the US. So, I mean, and I suppose you can experience it, right? I mean, yeah. I live in Branson and I think within my 3K radius, I, I'm small for choice in terms of basically where to shop. But that's said and done. If you look at uh, which segment of the market has actually performed a lot, it's uh, within the convenience retail category. Uh, those are shopping centers less than 12,000 in uh, <clears throat> 12,000 square meters in terms of size. And they generally offer essential uh, or convenience goods uh, by design. So you could argue that maybe COVID has also pretty much played into that hand. Uh, things like student accommodation, affordable housing. So, so those type of uh, property types, including infrastructure, is pretty much where the action has really been. So if you elevate it to Africa and say, what is an Africa business case? Africa still carries probably the youngest demographic in the world. 
And most studies that you look at, whether you look at population 2030, or so and recently looking at population demographics, looking out to 2100, uh, the demographics of Africa are generally good. You've got a young population, a very growing middle class, infrastructure backlog uh, that is going to keep us occupied for a very long time. So all those ingredients uh, spell, I suppose, economic prosperity if you invest in the, over the next 10 to 20 years. It will build business, it will build uh, the build environment, etc. So within what we've looked at, um, I suppose being South African, we tend to try find markets that are similar to ours because familiarity and network is important. It's, uh, you can lose your t-shirt very quickly if you go to markets without a partner or an element of familiarity. So we like East Africa. So East Africa has um, shown a lot of political stability. has been pretty much uh, decent growth, even though it's been uh, erratic, but the fundamentals are good. West Africa, in terms of uh, Ghana, uh, very similar to South Africa, uh, has also been a very good uh, investment uh, destination. Nigeria, fundamentals are good, but it's an extremely, extremely difficult place to <laughs> make investments work. So we can share a little bit of war stories uh, a bit later. But yeah. But yeah, we like affordable housing, uh, we like student accommodation, and we like uh, convenience retail pretty much throughout uh, the continent, where clearly English is a language of uh, choice to cater for the familiarity argument that I'm making. Excellent, well, great. I think nice way to set the scene. It's something that we could learn from. And we're gonna bring in Nick, yeah, I know you've, we, we, we've kept you uh, at last there, because Nick, I mean, after listening to all of this, we know this, when there's crisis, there's, uh, there's absolute opportunity. So I think maybe you guys, uh, can, Nick, you can tell us what you, you guys have an investment model in which private investors get very strong returns uh, in being part of the funding of residential developments. Okay, Ben mentioned affordable housing, student accommodation. So what do you think are the main things investors look for uh, in any investment? I mean, talking about yours included. So Neil, yeah, thanks. Uh, morning. I think I think you mentioned something earlier. You mentioned niche markets or, or niche if you're American. Yeah, is yeah. Um, is we are we we very we very much in that in that mindset. So so we're in we're in the residential development funding space, but private investors are the funders of these projects. And about seven years ago, you know, we were founded 15 years ago, but about seven, six to seven years ago, we segmented that niche even further, um, just from a risk tolerance perspective. And we, we now strategically only fund projects in the Greater Cape Town area. Um, we just think the fundamentals have been better there for some time. And we stick to residential projects in the middle income sector. So it's a high demand sector. <clears throat> and as a further niche, we, we, at the moment, we're currently busy funding only our internal projects. So we, we have, over, over half a decade or more, really channeled our focus. Um, and I think it goes into what you're saying is, if you look at South Africa from, from a broad perspective, you tend to look at it as, as a bit of doom and gloom. But there are certainly areas that are performing well. And I think those niches need to be unlocked, which is, I think part of the reason for having these webinars is to try and identify those areas that, that people, Absolutely. normal people, you and I can actually find investments. So just going back to your question, Neil, um, I think it's easier. There are, a few, there are a few things I'd like to chat about that. Um, first thing is that I think experienced investors tend to dissect investments um, a great deal. So they look at a, a variety of factors. But I think for the, for the normal investor, there, there are a couple of, of fundamentals that people would look at. So I think the first and foremost thing is capital security. I think normal, normal investors, that's especially now in terms of the economy, capital security is primary, but you know, the guys are looking for strong inflation beating returns. And I mean, inflation's creeped up. I think lately it's crept up to over 5% and that's just the official marker. John might be able to um, expand a bit on that. Um, but I think, 
practical inflation, what I mean by that is probably even higher. I mean, if you look at electricity prices, food prices have gone up. So I think inflation beating returns are fundamental and they're getting harder and harder to find. Um, I think investors want predictability. You know, you've got to, it's, it's very difficult to, to govern one's financial future if you don't know where it's going to a certain extent. And I think now more than ever, predictability plays a, a hell of a role in, in, um, in people's decision making. Um, I think given the, given the fact that South Africa is in quite a fluid economic state, what I mean by that is there's a lot going on. Um, people are, are reticent to think too long term. So I think what, what investors might look for now is not being locked in too long in any particular investment cycle. Um, because traditionally, you're gonna get better returns with your fixed, fixed deposits, et cetera, over a long period. People might have to look in other places. And that, that's where I think these alternative investments play such an important role. And then a couple of other things, I think track record's important. Investors need to look at that, which is, which is obvious if they're looking to, to make some good returns. And uh, a topic that's quite, quite high on everyone's agenda at the moment is fees. You know, there's been, been a lot written last year or so about, um, you know, management fees that are high and it's impacting people's, uh, people's uh, net returns. Um, so I think those are the, these are the main things that I think people will look at um, or should look at when they're looking at, at investments. Okay, so then I think we're going to bring in uh, you here, John, because um, I know you've just recently come out with the quarterly uh, FMB report, and it always makes very interesting uh, uh, analysis. So can you maybe just uh, share with us which of the areas in, you know, in commercial, and I know your focus is more on commercial now, but also residential, that are performing the best and, uh, and also which areas are performing the worst. And I know the landscape has changed quite a bit since the pandemic kicked in. Yeah, it's, um, that's, I think, important to, to, to remember, Neil, is that, you know, I think we've all been come hooked up in the last few days' events, but there's, there's a whole lot of other interesting events going on in the, in the country or in the world, for that matter, uh, relating to property. I mean, the one is the, the work from home sort of surge that we saw forced on us by lockdown and how does that play out for office space uh, you know going forward I, I believe an increased level of working from home is is bad for the office markets uh, for a while they'll have to find something else to do with that property so what we, and what we're seeing certainly in our property broker surveys is that office is turning out panning out to be the underperformer this year retails come back a little it, it, it got hit the probably the hardest Last year, with the, the hard lockdowns, I mean, a lot of retailers just had to close entirely, uh, restaurants, you know, the whole lot. So, so retail property really took the, the brunt. Well, apart from hotel property, that was, that was real carnage, unfortunately, and still is. But retail coming back um, reasonably, uh, the smaller centers, the ones more focused on essentials. And I think that's the way it's going to be for the time being when you look at retail is, is that the, the, the smaller more essentials focused uh, centers would be the ones to outperform the, the ones with restaurants and entertainment as a bigger focus, the, the super regionals, the regionals, I think they've got some serious challenges. Um, but the outperformer, it's turning out to be of the, the major uh, commercial property sectors is industrial. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with the increased interest in lo logistics uh, related to e-commerce, which is arriving it's 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 on its way whether you know people can deny it or not but it is on its on its way in a bigger um in a bigger way uh so 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 according to the broker surveys industrial looks to be the key outperformer this year retail somewhere in the middle of the big three office underperformer it's got ish, serious issues and with that when you when you go to regions it means that there's some significant issues to to address around the major office nodes of the country Northern Johannesburg, Santon, Sunning Hill, Rivonia, Cape Town CBD, um, high office vacancy rates, not easy to convert into residential at this stage because you've got high residential vacancy rates as well. So, so around office nodes or whatever, there are some key challenges. I'd say that's the underperforming sort of uh, part of the, of the market for the for foreseeable future. What about the effect of semigration, uh, John? I mean, okay, yeah, that's, now that's, that's a very interesting one. 
Um, I remember in the early 90s reading a newspaper article touting the West Coast region of the country as the politically most stable and, you know, sort of singing its praises. And, it, you know, you, you just, I just remember from that article, you know, thinking, well, you know, people must be thinking about this, you know, where do you go now? Because there, there was a bit of, there were serious concerns in the country during that political transition as to how it would play out. Um, I don't think people could move as easily in those days because technology didn't allow it. But nowadays it does. You, 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 you can really, we've seen people working and commuting, uh, long distance commuting uh, more and more and more. And, and the technology gets better and better and enables it. So, um, and, and bank head offices aren't even all in Joburg anymore either. So um, I think that, how does, that, how does that play out? Well, I think the Western Cape as a province, as a total province, benefits most from it still. That's been the most populous immigration destination for many years. And I think that that'll probably carry on. But maybe with a shift in focus where it's not so much the city of Cape Town, but an increased uh, popularity of the smaller towns moving out up the West Coast down into the Southern Cape. The Southern Cape could become a key semigration destination um, going forward. But that's what I think what to look out for. Uh, the work from home, uh, not everybody's going to stay working from home after the lockdown. Let's not fool ourselves. But, but I think it's coming in over the longer run, it's coming to South Africa in a significantly bigger way. And uh, it means that smaller, more outlying towns in, in you know, around not, not far from major metros, or actually can be quite far these days, can be increasingly sought after. You've seen a lot of that in, in, around the Western Cape, Hermanus and those places becoming very popular over the years. I think that that could become even more the case, and especially down Southern Cape Way and maybe up the West Coast as well. That would be my thinking, yeah. Excellent. Okay, great. Nice way to analogy. So, Ben, um, I mean, you moved into a, um, I mean, to get into the African market. I mean, I know that there's, there's always been challenges, you know, coming out from South Africa, one being, you know, title, um, um, getting the right partners, getting funding and that kind of stuff. Mm. What has your experience been? I know, uh, are you in, still involved in South Africa or are you exclusively looking at uh, African markets? No, we do, we do both. So we've got a Pan Africa fund, a majority of which is in South Africa. Okay, great. And like most things your investors dictate, right? So most investors generally, if you are not strong at home, you don't just buy confidence to be successful outside of your home market. So it was important for us then to start in SA, be firm and strong in SA, and then look outside. But then what's interesting though, in terms of how investors are, I suppose, viewing at these things. So if I just say separate institutional investors to your GFIs, your development finance institutions, so I found it interesting in a sense that most DFIs, if you are raising capital for a pure South African fund, it's an uphill battle because uh, to most DFIs, they still view South Africa as developed in relation to the rest of the country. So you still have a better chance if your mandate is more of a pan African nature and hopefully, I mean, a higher allocation outside of SA than within SA. And most institutional investors are still, I suppose, thinking and processing the amendments to Regulation 28, which will allow them to invest more into uh, alternative uh, investments. And clearly, they look at South Africa because, uh, as I said earlier, the problem that we need to apply our minds to solving is South Africa. So we do need to achieve the economic reforms that John was uh, alluding to earlier. And way of doing that is to, I suppose, direct money into activities that create jobs and catalyze economic activity. And um, even though I believe in diversification, I think a lot of our JC companies, are, yeah, I, I can argue that Half of them are not really South African based in terms of any sources, or the impact from them is less. So we do need to channel more money, and it's a collective effort. So from institutions to private investors, high net worth, we need to focus our energies in that regard. 
Nick, bringing you in here, I mean, you always want to try and beat the market averages. And, uh, and I think uh, that would be your goal for your investors. How have you seen the investment market uh, for the last few years? Um, how's that been for you? And uh, what's available out there? Yeah, Neil, absolutely. So it's, it's interesting that, um, you know, I'll, I'll first say from our point of view, our investments for, for a long time, our returns have been reasonably consistent over time. Um, but if you look at various other sectors, they started to struggle. And um, I hope I'm forgiven for sharing some other companies' <laughs> investment information, which might be a punt or not for them. I'm not sure. But you'll certainly see over the last you know, five years or so, there's generally been a, a, a big downward trend in, in more traditional investment types, which means that I would say the search for alternative investments has become quite critical. And you just got to try and find the the right ones. So if you don't mind, um, you know, we don't want to be too partisan in this discussion. And, and I, I'm trying to illustrate a broader, broader span of what investment types that are out there for investors, because that's the purpose of this, to show people what, what is available out there. It's not just us. So just if, if you look at that, it's, it might be a bit small for people to see, but, you know, if you have a look at that, um, you know, you can see I've, I've taken a snapshot of some of the better performing funds over the last 10 year average. And you'll see they were, they were trucking between sort of 11 and, and, and 13%. That's your, that's your unit trusts, um, which are pretty good returns over a 10 year span. But if you look at the five year average, they've, they've come down significantly, which I think has prompted this push towards finding, you know, alternative methods of investments to start putting a proper dent in inflation creep, so to speak. Um, you know, there's some pretty nice returns as well. If, if you look at places like African Bank or Discovery Bank over time, they got some pretty decent fixed interest rates. Um, but to get those rates, you're locked in for a long period, which I'll go back to what I mentioned earlier about the fluidity of the South African economy. Um, this means you, you really are tying up funds for an extended period, and some people just don't have that appetite um at all and then i've also got i've also got a few examples of alternative investments out there which have done quite well you know section 12j obviously that's come to an end but yes, there have been some for those guys who got in in time there have been some really good good performers there and in, in particular the infinity anchor fund has done well um it i think pushed last year about 15 percent per annum which is a which is a very very attractive return um, Sasfin, I don't know how far they are with the Scott Street one actually, but they've actually created a secondary market for a, a pre, pre-existing private equity investment. And that target return is also around 15%, which might be attractive to guys. So you can see there's, there's a range of, of things that people can choose from. And then uh, it would be remiss of me not to shamelessly punt ourselves at this juncture where, um, where we are we've got returns going at 15 to 18 percent per annum with with the full capital protection in terms of development and property assets to back that up um, which is also very attractive so that's a nice range of of things out there for people to start looking at and, and trying to get their teeth into to to get their returns uh, beating inflation certainly okay excellent John, I want to bring you in over here. I mean, the, the questions are coming in, so I do encourage you just to, to fire, you know, fire away those questions. Um, and it's more related to the residential property market. Now, you alluded just now, we've seen that rentals have taken a big knock um, in, in residential. And, uh, and, and obviously, you know, we still need to house the, the nation. And I think uh, Ben's also in the affordable space. And so is Nick. He's also in the entry level sort of area which he hasn't actually ex expanded on at this stage but i think that um where do you foresee um you know growth nodes and and maybe just unpack the the residential a little bit more um i mean we touched on the immigration but where's that where's the growth nodes kind of do you foresee is going to be i mean because the buy to let market is, is pretty much been decimated the traditional buy to let what are your comments on that yeah, it's, I think there's more questions and answers at the moment, but um, the, you know, because of the, 
we, we're all waiting to see how work from home pans out. But, uh, you know, I would say that you, within cities, it's probably more your outward, more spacious type suburban areas that start to relatively outperform a little, whereas the high density residential, well, they go the office nodes and the high density residential nodes are often the same thing. Like around Santon, uh, very high residential vacancy rates, according to TPN estimates, looking worse than the office vacancy rate. Um, you know, I think those are the underperformers for the for, for the foreseeable future. Um, just, you know, we've got to a stage where if we're not going to be at the office very often, why do we need to live within walking distance or, you know, to avoid the traffic and all those nice things that, you know, created that appeal for high density upmarket living for a lot of those people. So, so I think that around your, 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 your key office nodes, I think what, I think values are going to correct downwards quite a bit. Um, and ultimately the residential that gets provided there is going to be far more affordable. I think that's where the whole, the whole income demographic of the Santons of the world, I think is going to change quite noticeably. So, um, so yeah, that, that's, it's, it's, I'm, I'm being very vague and broad. It's at the moment, it's sort of really wait and see, I think the rental market will recover uh, somewhat as interest rates. We expect interest rates to start rising late this year and rise gradually into next year because the rental market, okay, a lot of it was, I think, lockdown related in income loss, you know, people that might have less formal jobs in, you know, be it a restaurant or whatever they make their living from. But a lot of those people, I think, are rental market tenants and not uh, homeowners. And, and that, decimated their incomes that was a terrible year last year for them so that that sort of gradually comes back you would assume as 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 covid gradually gets under some sort of control uh that helps the rental market as interest rates go up as well that surge of home as first time home buying that we saw last year with rate cutting that subsides because that took a whole lot of people out of the rental market i believe they all went off to go and buy houses or a lot you know a lot of them and that left a hole in the rental market so i think the rental market does come back overall but but yeah around the major office nodes i think that's the weaker link further outwards probably in, in you know more i think space has become more appealing now um and then you know i think those popular semigration destinations for residential anyway i think those are going to outperform um, you know, as I say, Southern Cape is one I'm particularly interested to see how it pans out. But um, I'm, I'm speaking very broadly at the moment. I think, Neil, that yeah. the one thing we must realize, though, is that overall, you know, I, I always question this, um, you know, this desire to, uh, you know, I hear Nick with inflation beating returns, and it's all very nice. But, but at, at economic times like this, when you are in the stagnation phase, you know, Shouldn't we be more busy with a defensive strategy, something that's not going to shoot the lights out, but perhaps is just a safer investment? I, you know, you, we always learned it at uh, Varsity about, you know, at some stage, you, you, you know, cash is king even. You know, you're going to sit on something with almost no return just, you, you know, to, to be safe, you know, and ride out the, the storm. And then you sort of become more, as, as things improve again, you become more overweight in the more riskier assets. It seems like that's been lost in the modern world. Everybody just wants to make these lovely double digit returns all the time. And I'm not sure that's really realistic in this economic environment we're in for the foreseeable future. Okay, Nick, I'm gonna bring you in because uh, I think it would be fair to you to comment on John <laughs> on that particular one. And then Ben also, you, could, you might have some comments in terms of what are you seeing you know, differently as well. So Nick, first you. Just unmuted. John's got a point. John's got a point in the sense that I think I think when when a when something a situation like an economy is volatile, people are looking to harness better returns in shorter periods of time because you know when you plan long term, then you have a fundamental faith in the stability of the environment that you're in. That obviously is not where we are at the moment. So I think that's driving people towards higher returns. Um, you know, there's, there's also, John's talking about people going towards, you know, the safe route, which is, which is all well and good, and that's fine. The problem is, John, at the moment, is that the traditionally safe routes like money markets are performing really poorly because of the low interest rate environment. So if you can get 
if you can get something that's performing a bit better than, than the money market rates, then so be it. And the other thing to, to contend with is that, you know, when people think about high returns, they immediately think high risk. But if you start digging into some of these alternative investments, you'll, start, you'll see that risk is being mitigated to a large extent. I think people are learning those lessons from a long time ago where, um, where risky investments, I mean, high, high yielding investments came at huge risk. And I think those, those fundamentals are changing a bit as well. And then the last thing I'd like to mention on that, on that side is that, you know, when, when guys are looking at, at returns, and I'll take exact examples. You know, when we go back five years ago, for example, six years ago with our current investment structure, um, I think it's about five years ago, Cape Town was going through a bit of a wobbly because of, I think it was the drought at that stage, something to that effect, or four years ago. And guys were, were reticent to invest because they thought that something, the, the property market was going to be affected. And then a year later, there was something else. I think that's when the comments about EWC came to the fore and people, people were reticent to invest then. So I think people get, get, can fall into the cycle where they fear investing. And I mean investing with, with some purpose because they want to wait and see what happens. And We've seen that with, with guys who literally, from our company's point of view, people we're in contact with who still haven't invested, but peers of theirs invested five or six or seven years ago and have reaped the benefits thereof because I thought, okay, let's, let's go along with it. And the guys who are waiting for something to change are still waiting for something to change in order to convince them to go for a decent return. So. Um, I think from an alternative investment space as well, Neil, my final comment is that it should be a part of one's portfolio and not the Hail Mary as well. You know, that's where diversification becomes key and alternative investments like ours to punt us again is, is gives, gives those investors an access into the property sector as part of their portfolio where it's a passive and decent yielding return. And then they can, they can form their fundamentals in, in other investment areas as well. Excellent. Thanks for that, Nick. Um, question for you, Ben. Um, and I don't know if you can uh, do it off the cuff, but uh, it says, can you share significant data and analytics regarding the student accommodation real estate market? What are the prospects of the market in the short term? But I'm sure you've got the the short answers up front, uh, the significant data and analytics might be a problem right now. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, all, all I can say is that fundamentally, we're still sitting with such a huge uh, student accommodation backlog. I think the numbers, I don't know, probably going to the millions of uh, backlog in terms of, um, I suppose, the demand for student accommodation vis-a-vis -vis the supply. Uh, but then that's it and done. The short-term environment is challenging, of course, because NASFAS is part of uh, FESCOs, and FESCOs, we know, has been uh, challenged in the sense that our income statement and balance sheet as a country has been challenged. So as government becomes more frugal, um, yeah, one of the affected areas has been NASFAS. So the way that we look at it is that it's a bit uh, risky right now to do greenfield development and student accommodation unless you can get a, a, an arrangement, a triple net lease with the university or some backing from the university to secure your income. Because as said and done, the banks are also extremely conservative. Uh, so they're still <clears throat> in the COVID uh, washing machine uh, so credit is still prudently managed as opposed to being opened. Uh, so yeah, but there's some still good uh, brownfield opportunities uh, that still exist. So I always think property is so localized. So, so long as, I suppose, you clear around the fundamentals that inform your investment decision, and which is basically the demand and supply uh, situation with each opportunity that you look at. Excellent. Thanks for that, Ben. 
Okay, I can't believe how the time's moved on so fast. And uh, so what I'm going to get to is, uh, and I will get, there's quite a few questions for you, Nick, which I will drop into the last uh, slot for you. Uh, but I'm going to ask John uh, to give us your wrap, your, your final thoughts uh, to, to everybody out there, just in terms of, you know, the way forward. I know you've, you've expanded quite a lot on the commercial sectors that's working well, that's not working well in the residential sectors. And, and maybe just to give us your final thoughts, your, your final wrap and uh, just sort of taking everything uh, from today. Yeah. Look, um, historically, I mean, we've gone through these very long cycles, as I call it, the super cycles in the economy. Um, not many have happened in my lifetime because they are very long. And with it, you get these long periods of where property booms, you, uh, 1999 to 2008, for instance, a few hundred percent capital growth, you know, it was, it was glory days. And you get these long periods where you really have to search hard for for, for, for good returns and work, you know, you have to apply your mind because, you know, the, pro, the market is sort of broadly correcting, you know, often it's not a correction in terms of a drop in values, but it might be nominal values growing so low that they're under inflation. And therefore in real terms, as economists talk about you, you're declining. That's the broad situation, which we unfortunately in at the moment, it's, you know, it is what it is. The economy is what it is. And so that's where the property market is. I think the big, the big um, uh, lesson I learned from the last big turbulent era of the, uh, of the previous political transition and that three-year recession of the early 90s is not to, try, you, not to try and predict the future too much. Now, that's, you know, everybody wants to predict the future, but the reality is that you can't. And um, you, well, you can't do it very well. And in times like this, you can do it even less well. Um, and, you know, I, I remember at the time as a student thinking that I was, you know, thinking, you know, watching the Cold War play out in the sub-Saharan Africa, watching conflicts all around us, lots of which we were involved in, unrest situations all over the country. The military were everywhere. And, you know, it was, and it was a much bigger military in those days, too. And it was really a, a rough environment. And you couldn't really see it changing. It was really difficult to imagine a way out, you know. And suddenly, within a short space of time, I mean, uh, Namibia had become independent. The Berlin Wall had collapsed. That was the end of the Soviet Union and the beginning of the end of the Cold War. Um, you know, Nelson Mandela and the a ANC were unbanned and released. And four years later, you couldn't imagine how well it could suddenly turn out. So, you know, I think that's, that's the thing. We tend to think in straight lines. You know, if something's trending upwards, we think it's going to go on forever. That's why property bubbles happen, because when it's going well, it's just going to carry on forever. And when it's going badly, it's going to carry on forever. But the reality is, you know, and us economists have learned that is it works in cycles. Um, you know, and at some point it does turn. So, uh, you know, that's, 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 that's a general thought. We do get too wrapped up in the bad times when they come, or the good times when they come, um, for our own good. And, and we start to make bad decisions as a result. Uh, it, it, does, it does turn at some point, I believe. Well, that's good news. And Neil, can I, can I jump in there quickly? Yes, you can. Yeah, I think, I think uh, John obviously has some, some hell of a good points there. I just want to go, John. Um, so last November, I think it was last November or early December, I heard you on, on Cape Talk with Bruce Whitfield. Um, and I was, I was very intrigued and, and I enjoyed your comments on that show. And one of them in particular was, was you, you correlated the residential market versus commercial versus retail, et cetera. And especially the lower income to middle income residential space, you were reasonably bullish about that over the next sort of decade or so, just because of the, um, the I think, the youth in our country and that we, we've got a growing population in that sector. Well, um, what are your thoughts on that still? Yeah, Nick, I think, um, you know, nothing, unfortunately, in this economic environment, there's little that's going to shoot the lights out. But when you talk about relative performances, again, okay, commercial, I've already said, industrial is the relative outperformer. In residential, yes, I think it's, it's, it's affordable. You know, the more affordable, almost the better, I think. Um, the, the reality is that uh, when you're in this economic environment, it's about essentials. You know, luxury stuff, be it luxury consumer goods, luxury 
retail, luxury, residential or whatever isn't going to fly wonderfully. You know, there's, there's, there's spots that will, you know, there, there sure is, but, but, um, but, uh, but I'm talking overall, it's about essentials. I guess the challenge though, and you know, Ben might know more about this than me, but I guess the challenge we, we, we're in now is to, to try and make affordable housing more affordable. Um, you know, through a different type of materials and a different type of construction method. And it's not my area of expertise, but, you know, we've made some significant inroads in affordable housing over the past two, three decades. But, uh, you know, there's still a lot of people that aren't housed and how do you get them housed? Well, it's just got to be something more affordable, I guess. So, uh, but yeah, you know, I'd, I'd, re relatively speaking, yes, I'd be more optimistic about the performance of the more affordable side of the market, definitely. Yeah. yeah, and I think and there's, a, there's a plethora of, you know, opportunity in that market that hasn't really been discovered, I think, in South Africa to a large extent. And uh, so, yes, I agree with you, John, on that one. Nick, did you want to add that there was another comment you wanted to make to that or not? Yeah, I was just, uh, uh, Ben alluded to it earlier in terms of sort of the fixed assets and, and fixed income generating, and people want a bit of sort of tangibility and a bit more security around their investments. And I was wondering from, you know, John or Ben, of whether they see with with the turbulent economy, does it drive investors towards fixed assets per se? Does does that give people more comfort in the in the investment sector as a whole? I think Ben, you can come in over here. I was going to say, tongue in cheek, clearly the distraction over the last few days means that there's going to be lots of new investment being made in infrastructure here in terms of rebuild. But on a serious note, yeah, I mean, I'm. To, to link back to where I started, I'm a big impact investor. I think it's uh, important to just be deliberate and conscious in terms of where you put your money to work. And I believe in private markets or real assets because they do give you that predictable, reliable, growing income stream because your income to a large extent is secured. And as you mentioned, Nick, your asset to a large extent is also uh, protected. And anything that creates jobs, Catalyzes economic development, I think, is what the country requires from a reform perspective to reduce uh, inequality that we all need to do something about. Excellent. Okay. Yes. So I think then we're going to get to the, the final the final wrap. I mean, uh, that was uh, your final wrap, Ben, unless you want to add something to that. Are you no, quite happy or any last words? <laughs> no, that was it. Thanks. <laughs> okay, excellent. I'd like to say thank you to you both, Ben and John, for your contribution today. Don't disappear just quite yet. Uh, Nick, what I'm going to do is ask you, there's a, there's a couple of questions which is related to the investment, which I'm going to pose to you, which you could maybe just answer up front. And then I think you can close with your parting shots right at the end. Uh, the first one pertains to the investment period when investing with private capital. The typical minimum uh, investment amount is the 15% guaranteed. And uh, have, have you seen many property developments not being successful and collapsing? What happens to your investment in this case? Uh, and how safe will it be to invest with you guys? So it's quite a lot. And I think you've got the gist of it. Uh, so Nick, maybe you want to just wrap that up in just in terms of how that works and then i test, think straight after that if you can testing my short-term memory and, and, <laughs> yeah. and our, our investment our investment period over time has the average has been around 15 months um that's per funding cycle that investors are, are, are in for a, a funding cycle for our current investments that we got going they projected to be around the 12 month mark so a little bit shorter than our average uh, the minimum investment is 100,000 Rand and upwards, and it's yes. a tiered investment. So, um, you know, the more you invest, the higher your, your returns are going to be. In terms of guaranteed returns, no, they're certainly not guaranteed. They are they're fixed returns, meaning, meaning that when all things being equal, that's, wh that's what your return will be calculated at. Having said that, um, since we changed our investment structure about seven years ago to offer fixed returns where investors were getting all the security, we have never not um, had investors achieve our predetermined returns. Even last year during COVID, they still got their, their, the returns that were projected then, which is at 18% per annum. So um, 
that those are three of the questions. There was one more in terms yeah, the of one, projects, the one was related projects to failing. Property I think. development not being successful and collapsing. Yeah. What happens yeah. to your investment and how safe it is to invest with you guys? Because I think that, that's sort of the the trust. So so the so there's it's actually a, a long answer. Um, <laughs> but in, in short, in short, one of the risks obviously in developments which we see is developments collapsing or not going ahead. Now, obviously, the percentage of developments that actually succeed is a lot higher than those that fail. Otherwise, you wouldn't see any, any things um, being built. But we've identified a certain, certain number of the risk areas. The first one is this, is we don't take on any big projects anymore. So we take on small to medium-sized projects. They've got shorter life cycles. Uh, we tend to do them solely in, as I mentioned earlier, in these middle income areas of Cape Town, where there's a strong appetite for the end product. In fact, our investable pipeline for the next three years is already set. Um, and that's all projects in the northern suburbs of Cape Town where, where rental vacancies are low, which is a good foundation of, of how things are. Um, properties are selling really well in that middle income, sort of between 1.3 and 1.5 million mark. So those are... Those are some of the things that we, we do to minimize the risk because you want to exit the project. Then the other, the other thing that, which we do certainly internally is that the projects are funded in stages and each stage is compartmentalized to finish a certain part of the project. So in other words, the first funding stage will be for the land, infrastructure, services, boundary walls, gates, etc. So there's intrinsic value that's unlocked from there. And from there on, the construction phases are then done as well. So we'll raise enough capital to do a certain part of the construction phase so that you've got, you don't sit with a half-baked cake, so to speak. And that's something that's, that obviously aids, um, aids us in our project. So we've never sat with a, a non-completed project either. Um, so I think the, the main factors where projects don't complete, one is, being unable to sell the properties, and as I said, live, you know, operating in, in pretty high demand areas helps that along. Um, if the properties don't sell, they will be completed because the funding's in place for each different stage. Then you can put tenants in place at least in order to, to prop that up if properties aren't being sold because the, the economy in the country is in some sort of chaos. Um, and yeah. the those are, those are the main factors, I think, that Okay, that I think you've touched on most of them. So, Nick, do you want to just give us your quick one-minute final wrap? Yeah, the final wrap, I think, I think going to my second slide, is just to say there, there are investment opportunities out there, and I think, I think guys just need to dig a bit deeper, um, do their due diligence, and, and maybe find things that don't lock them in for too long, just from that risk perspective. And finally, and I'm going back to what John, uh, something John said earlier, is you need to have an adequate part of one's portfolio that is reasonably stable. But I certainly think, and John might disagree, is that you need to prop it up with something that's going to give you a bit of a bolster in terms of a, a higher return. So diversify in that sense is my, is, is all my comments. Excellent. No, thank you very much, uh, Nick. Uh, I don't think we all have to agree, but I think I just want to, that does bring us to the end of the webinar. I'd like to thank all of our expert panelists for your valuable contribution today. John Lewis, property economist from FMB, Ben Kodazang, founder and CEO of ALT Capital Partners, and of course, last but not least, Nick Morgan, our sponsor for today of Opportunity Capital, founder and director. Thank you. So future events. So before you go, I need to give you some really important information. We're really excited about this uh, REI's third annual digitalization of Real Estate Virtual Summit. And we're launching next week as a summit weekly series in four parts, starting next Thursday at 12 o'clock. Entry is free. So if you need to book, just click on the, on the link below. The summit series uh, culminates in a four-day summit hosted on Thursday, the 19th of August from 10 to 3 o'clock. It's not going to be on Zoom, guys. It's going to be South Africa's biggest prop tech and digitalization event on a new 3D world-leading webinar technology never used in South Africa before. And uh, this, is a, this mimics a real-life event, and this is what we need in these times, is to interact with people. 
and uh, with the speakers and uh, using microphones and clapping that we can hear each other, where we can source lots of valuable content and network, uh, both live content and on demand. It's a massive opportunity for you to unlock and transform your business to digital and also for investors to find out the leading trends in prop tech that is changing the real estate space. On the day for the summit, it's only 397 Rand early bird tickets. You can just click on the link below. Thank our sponsors for today, Opportunity Private Capital. And for John, Nick and Ben, I think it was a fantastic conversation. Great insights. I mean, we've got three uh, experts here who've given us fantastic uh, viewpoints of, of the way forward. Uh, so thank you all again. An inspirational quote from Buckminster Fuller. And he said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. I mean, isn't that some wise words? This is Neil Peterson of Real Estate Investors signing out. Stay safe and successful investing.